If you look for it, I've got a sneaky feeling you'll find that love actually is all around. Matt. Hello. This is it. This is our Colin Firth and Hugh Grant episode. Mm, different. Um, now, it seems a bit weird because it's very specific. <laughs> um, but there is a reason. It is their birthday this month. Yep. It's very strange because they're quite similar or they seem quite similar on the surface, but they're only a day apart as well, <laughs> which is like, yeah. it's like they're almost the same person. I don't know any other actors who have done such similar work and also mm. were born literally seconds apart. It's almost like it was like fated mm. or something. It is unusual. Yeah. They're both big British stars, both of a similar bumbling charm, haven't mm. they? Sort of a persona. Yeah. And obviously, we're going to look at this through a series of films, mm. um, which we always do. Um, but we'll also, I think, see when we're doing um, just a quick overview of their careers, that they are actually quite different. <laughs> they are, yeah. Their, their yeah. choices and the routes that they've gone down are actually very different. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll kick it off with Hugh Grant because he is one day older. <laughs> so we'll start with him and go Correct. in order. Um, and so we'll kick it off to you. Okay. Back to start. Well, yeah, this was interesting. It's one of those people, in fact, both of them probably, I, I just never thought to look into them mm -hmm. before, so this was interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah, so Hugh Grant was born one day earlier. He was on the 9th of September 1960. He actually studied English at Oxford University, and mm -hmm. acting was only really a thing on the side, so he did stuff with the Dramatic Society, and, and yeah. his very first film was with the Oxford University Film Foundation. And that was also the debut of people like Mark Williams, composer yeah. Rachel Portman. That was her first film work as well. So that's quite interesting. I'd never seen that. I don't know if yeah. it's widely accessible. And then, yeah, he sort of did writing comedy sketches for TV shows and radio commercials, and he had a sketch comedy group, and he had lots of mini roles in TV and film and stuff, but he got his first big break um, in a Merchant Ivory drama mm -hmm. called Maurice, or Morris, they yeah, call it. Yeah, it's um, Ian Forster, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, yeah. For a first film, it's, it's bloody good. And he actually won joint with uh, James Wilby, who plays the main character. They both shared the mm -hmm. Best Actor Award at the Venice Film Festival that year. Oh, wow. So that's like a really good first shout. Yeah, it's a cracking start. <laughs> yeah, and his career goes in sort of three stages, and this first stage is these period dramas. So he did another Merchant Ivory mm -hmm. drama, The Remains of the Day, yeah. with Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. Yes, that's right. And then obviously Emma Thompson adapted Sense and Sensibility and asked yeah. him to be in that as well. It's who you know. <laughs> well, it seems like it, and they are going to meet again. They are. But then, obviously, he was well known for doing all of the rom-com stuff, and he was actually 34 when Four Weddings was released, which is kind of kind of bizarre. Yeah, because he's so young, yeah. Yeah, innocence about him at that mm -hmm. point. He's really well known for Four Weddings. He auditioned, but Richard Curtis didn't really like him at all. <laughs> um, he wanted the role to be more like himself, you know, so that right. you wouldn't you wouldn't expect him to get the girl at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. But he came around to the idea, and Hugh Grant obviously won. He won a BAFTA for a leading actor. He won a Golden Globe for best actor musical comedy. And this was yeah that launched him. And on the back of that, with Richard Curtis, we got the likes of Notting Hill in '99. Yeah, he was nominated for a Golden mm -hmm. Globe for that. Uh, Bridget Jones came after that, and the sequel is this sort of womanizer boss Daniel Cleaver. Uh, mm -hmm. Two weeks notice with Sandra Bullock about a boy with Tony Collette and Rachel Weisz. He was nominated for a Golden Globe for that. Then Love Actually, massive film, uh, music and lyrics with Drew Barrymore. And then did you hear about the Morgans as well, which was the sort of critical commercial flop, I think. Yeah, it's when the turning point started to come, I think. Mm, yeah. And then after that, people have referred to it as like a Hugh Grant resurgence. So it kind of is. It is, yeah. Because the roles he started doing were vastly different. I mean, the first big thing he did after that was Cloud Atlas, which then was the mm -hmm. most expensive independent film ever made, playing six yeah. villains. And that was very out of character for him. <laughs> yeah. was, it was not what you would expect him to no. come out with after his, his like previous films. Mm. But that was quite impressive, though, I think, mm. because people looked at him differently. Yeah. And then things like, you know, he did the rewrite, which is a rom-com, but it's a new angle, really, that better reflected his age and his yeah. his career. Florence Foster Jenkins was still comedy, but more serious performance. Yeah, there was something more in it, wasn't there, in that one? A bit more substance. Mm. Again, uh, BAFTA nominated, Golden Globe, SAG nominated. 
um, things like Paddington Two, which came along again, quite a self-reflexive role. You know, it's it's it's, it's him poking fun at himself and his career, I think, mm-hmm. and it works perfectly. Nominated for BAFTA, yeah, brilliant, um, absolutely brilliant. And then most recently was The Gentleman, the Guy Ritchie action comedy film. So I think over time he's just found new ways to do things with what he already had. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so period rom coms and resurgence is what I've managed to dig out of his career. <laughs> mm. Okay, well, we'll go on to Colin Firth. Um, so Colin Firth was born on the 10th of September, 1960. <laughs> we should say they're both turning 60, which is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, that's true. He was born in Hampshire. And he, by 14, he'd already decided he wanted to be a professional actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and he ended up um, moving to London and he joined the National Youth Theatre. Um, and from that, he then went on to uh, study at the Drama Centre of London. Um, and when you actually look, his career has kind of been split into sections, the same as mm. Hugh Grant, really. So you've got kind of the 1983 to 94 period, and they call it the Brit Pack. Oh, okay. Up and coming British actor alongside people like Tim Roth and Bruce Payne and Paul McGann and people like that. Mm-hmm. He's obviously had a lot more success than some of those. It started off in a little TV episode and they did a TV movie, lots of little things like that. But his big break, the thing that really put him on the map was Pride and Prejudice cool. when he did yeah. the TV miniseries in 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like, kind of exactly the same, he was 35. Mm. When he got that success, yeah, yeah, and he is a lot of people's Mr. Darcy. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, despite any other adaptations that have come before or since, he is Mr. Darcy, mm-hmm. and it really, really set him on this path, um, which is where kind of the second instalment of his career started. Really, from about ninety five to two thousand and two, it was the English romantic, mm-hmm. you know, period of of his career. He did roles in. Um, the English Patient. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in a, a small but interesting part in uh, Shakespeare in Love. Yeah. Um, the yeah. importance of being earnest, you know, things like that, mm-hmm. and um, and then obviously finished that up with um, Bridget Jones, in which he played another Mister Darcy. Yeah. <laughs> so he is quintessentially Mister Darcy. Pretty much. And then after that, he kind of took a different route from there. You've got the likes of um, What a Girl Wants that he did with um, Amanda Bynes. Mm. Um, and you've got Love Actually, which was a huge kind of British cast, mm-hmm. you know, uh, which he, he was brilliant in. And then he was in Nanny McPhee with Emma Thompson, St. Trinian's, uh, you know, a number of films where he was working with other very well-known actors. Um, and also then you had the other big ensemble film was Mamma Mia um, yeah. in 2008. <laughs> and so he kind of had this kind of ensemble period. Mm-hmm. But after that, it really takes a turn. Yeah. Um, it's like he did Mamma Mia, had loads of fun and was like, right, okay, I'm going to really get down to it now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and he started making really interesting choices, mm-hmm. really like awards worthy. And and this is where this more serious period of his yeah. career started. Like You've got stuff. things. Started off with a single man in mm-hmm. 2009, um, which was very different for him. I think a lot of people are like, oh my God, this is, this is yeah. Colin Firth. Wow. Um, and that got awards attention. Mm. And then he went on to do The King's Speech, which mm. he won the Best Actor Oscar for. Mm-hmm. And he was brilliant in that. Yeah. Um, then you've got the likes of Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, things mm. like The Railway Man. Um, and obviously, I think more recently, he has turned back to a more light affair. You've got the likes of Bridget Jones' Baby, which <laughs> he was in. He was in Mamma Mia 2, The Kingsman. Mm-hmm. Um, Mary Poppins Returns, you know, things like that. Secret Garden, I think, is what his most recent one. Yeah. Um, but there's a few more serious ones, like, kind of stuck in there. The Mercy, for instance. I think he just picks what he wants to do. There's not mm. really a clear choice for him now. I think he goes between light and more serious. Yeah, it sort of goes in waves, doesn't it? Every five years he'll have a change and do the opposite. Yeah, and... whatever he's in the mood for. Mm. But I think he's been uh, successful in, in all that he's done. Yeah. He's just reliable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's, in a, he's a joy to watch. Most of his films are, if not greatly successful, or at least, you know, entertaining liked. to watch, yeah. you know, and enjoyable. Yeah, and well-liked. Um, and I think he is a draw 
Mm-hmm. You know, you, you just draw people in. So yeah, they're very interesting. So that's um, that's our little summary of, mm-hmm. of their kind of careers, um, and we're going to jump right in with the first film. Mm-hmm. Um, which is four weddings and a funeral. Yeah. Now I'm going to let you start, Matt, because um, I'm sure you've got Ooh. a few more positive things to say than oh, okay. I may have. <laughs> it's one of those, is it? Oh, do you know it's a funny one. It really is a funny mm-hmm. one because there are parts of it I think are brilliant mm-hmm. and work really, really well. Yeah. But then there are other parts I hate with a passion. Okay. Well, so it, yeah. By the way, I hadn't watched this properly before, so this yes, is no, you'd never this seen is it. new to me. Um. The interesting thing about this is that obviously rom-coms as they exist now didn't exist then. No. As such, not, especially no. not the British kind. So what no. Richard Curtis did in writing this, it was still finding its feet, I think. Where it's rough around the edges isn't necessarily a bad thing. So in the mm-hmm. end, I actually found mm-hmm. myself more drawn to this than maybe Notting Hill, for example. Yeah, which is just following all of the cliches exactly. that have been built up. Mm-hmm. And what I think really characterize this one is that it's just a little bit more down to earth i think a little bit more realistic there's still characters in there that are Mm -hmm. you know very wealthy and well off Uh, as we go forwards through the other films you'll see that lifestyles are a bit more idealized as you go along but this one it's kind of not it's not ideal necessarily and i think Mm. that's where the comedy's more observational, I think it's more based on yes, definitely things that are relatable to everybody, and and, and he did something really good in harnessing things like social occasions. Mm-hmm. It's in the name, really, weddings and funerals and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And Richard Curtis and all of his collaborators really have always been really good at picking apart British traditions and conventions. A lot of the comedy and, and the enjoyment for me was watching them literally pick apart everything associated with weddings. <laughs> Um, yeah the people you bump into the character types the speeches the vows the outfits the first wedding especially mm. it felt so realistic i mean it was mm. i think it was more british than I, uh, than any film i think i've ever seen before <laughs> the dancing at the first wedding it was like yeah. totally true it was awkward and messy and mm-hmm. completely talentless yep. mm-hmm. you know it was it was real it felt like a real wedding all of the people kind of squashed together mm-hmm. and it was it was not choreographed and perfect and you know mm-hmm. there was none of that mm. it's like a, a rawness to it isn't it yeah and it's like you say richard curtis does capture that mm-hmm. i think he is very very good at capturing some things that actually relate to people because it feels like real life yeah I mean, there's other things as well, like the music and the DJs and the wedding photo. He really does pick yeah. apart everything. Mm-hmm. As a result, the characters are also, you know, the awkwardness. Um, yeah. British stereotypical tropes of even you know, lateness, drunkenness, yeah. being an absolute fool, um, over-apologising. Um, putting your foot in it, saying the wrong thing. like It's just the whole thing's chock-a-block. I mean, if we didn't know this film was British before it started, we <laughs> certainly knew when the swear words yeah. came out in those that very, very British accents. Yeah. It was uh, it, it put you on track straight away. Good point as well, actually. Yeah, there is bad language. Mm-hmm. And it's not throughout, but... But that's real life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sort of used flippantly as well. It's not... Yeah. It wasn't for any yeah. specific effect. It was just... That's how people talk, so that's how we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, and I guess overall, what really was standardised here is this sort of the curse of being a hopeless um, upper middle class Brit mm-hmm. in romance. Yeah. As endearing as it is, the frustrations that come with it, and I think that kind of mm-hmm. was a staple from then on. Yeah. This made Hugh Grant's persona mm. what so many copied afterwards. And it's something that Richard Curtis scripts always have is that kind of adorable, bumbling British <laughs> awkwardness that yeah. no one can quite pull off awkwardness like the British, I don't think. We <laughs> <laughs> um, just have a talent for it. Mm-hmm. And he, he does write that very well. Mm. It sounds like he's a very romantic person. Yeah, I think so. His films always have a theme of love. And I don't mean love as like, oh, it's so romantic. Mm. Real love, you know, relationships, mm-hmm. relationships with people, with friends and with family, sisters and brothers. And mm-hmm. all of his films have love as a theme. Yeah, and the different forms of it. Yeah, he writes it very, very well. Mm-hmm. I'm very confident going into his films that I'm going to come away happy. Oh, yeah. 
yeah. it's just he writes very satisfying films and obviously with us being british as well yeah. they are very relatable i don't know how relatable they might be to americans or you know oh, people know. from other countries they, i don't know what kind of effect they have on them but they are extremely relatable to us yeah the funny thing about it is that at the core of them if you strip away the it sounds stupid if you strip away the jokes i guess they're actually dramas mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's good in that you can still connect on a different level. The foundation of all the characters that are there is that, you know, they are yeah. very real and fleshed out and human, I suppose. Yeah. But then something, again, I think over time slips in and becomes more of a staple is these, what are now cliches, but at the time didn't seem that cliche because they haven't really been done, I suppose. All the grand mm -hmm. gestures and the speeches that people make, or running after someone, yeah. standing in the rain, or learning another language for someone. Yeah, the boy meets girl, loses girl, finds girl kind of thing mm. was in its infancy, really, yeah. at this point. Especially in, in British films, it wasn't really um, as well known, I don't think, at mm. that point. So we should say, I'll give it a little bit more background as to what the film is about. Oh, yeah. um, it's, it's, it really, it is in the title, it really is. Mm. It's it's four weddings and a funeral and it's a group <laughs> of friends, um, basically their experiences at these various weddings, mm. um, characters that they meet there and, and you kind of meet the characters that are going to get married earlier and then it's their wedding and then you follow on from there and... There's not really a lot to it. It's very simplistic. I mm. have to say, though, I'm going to start ripping it apart here. Um, there are parts of it, like I said, that I love. I think the, the script is, is in places, fantastic. It's brilliant. I think there's, it really shows off Hugh Grant. There's lots of great dialogue for him to like stumble over there. And there's lots of small details that are really comedy gold, mm. but you barely notice. Like Just for example, um, them sprinting past the joggers. <laughs> like to yeah, get to the yeah. wedding like little things that are just really funny mm -hmm. things Rowan Atkinson brilliant yeah, in this um, I think oh, just, he started so well the holy goat line is, <laughs> is brilliant it starts off he seems like he's going to do alright and then as soon as you hit that it's like oh mm. downhill from there uh, he is brilliant and it's so well cast mm -hmm. this movie Simon Callow as Gareth yep. is brilliant James Fleet mm -hmm. is hilarious he's basically playing the same part go. as he played in the Vicar of Dibley <laughs> yeah. um, but it's fantastic Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Kristen Scott Thomas. She's oh, she's yeah. divine in this. She's just she is. It's very subtle, but it, she's really good. Everyone except Andy, Andy McDowell. McDowell. Yeah, it was just annoying, and I just hate her. I'm sorry, but she's I just hate nice. her. No, she's not very good. I think she was cast in this for her face, but I'm not even sure why because she's not even that particularly no. pretty. I don't think. What did I say to you that she needs to brush her teeth? <laughs> oh, I just. I don't see what the attraction is to her. No, it looks like she smells, like she's someone who smells. <laughs> <laughs> I get it at first. She's this, you know, foreign oddity. She's American and mm. that's, you know, exotic. And, I, you know, and she's so bloody forward. How could you resist? He liked her from sight and then she's so mm. forward with him, you know, sleeps with him. And But then she disappears she just off, and then she? reappears <laughs> with his fiance. So, I mean, what a dick. Yeah. So she's obviously cheated on a fiance with him yeah. which makes her a horrible person yeah. and she's she it again, though, again. She? Yeah. yeah she does it again and she's obviously with this guy you know mm. for this exceedingly wealthy man for his money and mm. she doesn't care for him at all that's quite obvious no. i mean she's an awful person what are her redeeming features <laughs> there's a scene in the, in the cafe oh or my something. god don't even get me started she hints that she's had a lot of partners and he says well yeah. give me a give me an idea and she starts listing them all but she has 33 but she, it's not it's not the number it's the it's more that she's oh. saying it and not she has no consideration for how he feels. No. <laughs> but, but she's a complete slut. She's not. She's not um, recognised that he's interested in her. No, I think she knows. Oh, she's oh, done I it on purpose. She knows. Oh, I think so. Evil I think bitch. she knows. She just. I think she just doesn't care. Yeah. She knows that he cares for. Her. I mean, she's not daft. Mm. And then he and she takes him wedding dress shopping. How cruel! I'll just rub your nose in it. Come shopping yeah. with me. I'm going to marry N another now guy. Now you mention it, yeah. Yeah, oh, she's. I just don't. I don't think she's redeeming. No. But all of the side characters in this film are fantastic. Yeah. They're all brilliant. Yeah. I, honest to God, I could say with hand on heart, I would 
completely be fine if they took the rom com aspect yeah. of this, the main plot line out. Yeah, me too. I would I would be completely happy with it mm-hmm. because I just don't I don't get it. Why is she married in this weird old man? And she loves Hugh Grant, so like what's she doing? Mm. The the background is better than what they've put forward. Mm. And I really just I feel like it's promoting this relationship that's just wrong really yeah, I, I, don't I don't see it's a nice relationship and why would you be wanting that mm. why would you be you know yearning for th- that kind of relationship because she's toxic yeah I, just, <laughs> I don't get it i just don't understand it at all I mean, when you put it that way uh, yeah it's not to see yeah it. so this is why i'm very contradictory about it because there, there were parts of it i loved i think john hannah is yeah brilliant i, I mean that he, he's not in much but i love him in everything he stole the film for me that yeah. speech at the funeral is heartbreaking and the poem is it's perfectly chosen mm. and there were parts of this that were brilliant anything with gareth in it simon call was just fantastic mm. <laughs> you know I, the scene where kristen scott thomas um she admits that she's been in love with charles for oh, that's hugh grant for, mm-hmm. for years and you know and it's just sometimes it's just not fair you know you just you you fall in love with someone who's never going to love you back. And mm. there are scenes in this that are fantastic, mm-hmm. um, but it's just ruined for me by that main plot thread. Yeah. But it goes to show how good having a supporting cast can be and an ensemble. Exactly. And Richard Curtis's films really do mm. have that. Yeah. He, he is very good at casting, I think. Mm-hmm. He really is. Um, so I think we've we've covered all, well, all we can yeah. cover with that one. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're going to jump on to Bridget Jones' Diary, yeah. which features both of them. Yeah. Now, I didn't watch this this week. Yes, you didn't watch this. Um, I watched this one. Um, and I have to admit, I mean, I liked it anyway, but it is just one of those. It's just enjoyable. Mm. Oh, it's just, it's it's a 21st century rom-com. Yeah. Um, so it is very different in ways. There are elements of it that are much more modern, mm. not quite 10 years later. Um, the narrative of this is very well done, I think, because you learn everything you need to know about the character in a hilarious way all within the first few minutes. The all-by-myself sequence yeah. is just brilliant. So it's good. a great way to introduce a character. Uh, and then you've got the narration. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that, And I think that's particularly successful in this. Um, it does feel like a very noughties thing. Mm. Um, especially as it's told in like diary entries and resolutions. And th- that was quite popular in the early 21st <laughs> yeah. century before kind of social media came in. Um, and this, you get Hugh Grant as plays this kind of great smarmy bastard, basically. <laughs> you know, is it, at least he had the decency to like look shamefaced when she found out he cheated on him. Mm. But, you know, other than that, he's, he's pretty much, you know, mm. horrible. Yeah. Um, and he plays it really, really well. And uh, though American, Renee Zellweger is absolutely perfectly cast in this part. So, yeah, she is pretty good at doing it. I think if people didn't know who she was, mm. they could easily mistake her for English because she really does kind of just yeah. feel the part. Yeah. She felt very British. She had like the awkwardness yeah. down and, you know, she really picked up on those things that are quintessentially British. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think she was fantastic. I really yeah. do. Like an unusual choice, but you can't picture anyone yeah, else doing very, it. Yeah, very, very unusual. I don't think it went down well when it was first announced. Uh, not sure. I Probably think it was like, you're, you're picking an American from Texas to play Bridget Jones. It was mm. like, why? How? Why? There's so many British people you could pick. It's, you know, one of those types of things. She was Oscar nominated for this, I think. Yeah, I think she really like blew it out of the park. I think people went, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> I think the first one is the best. I think the others yeah. was just rehashing it was you know, ideas from the first one. Yeah. Um, but I, I think she's just the type of character that's just really entertaining to watch. Mm. Obviously, with this one based on the book. Yeah, I have read the book. Mm. It's good. It's entertaining because it's very quick and it's sharp. And it's, mm. you know, I listened to the audio book of it, which is interesting. But I, I actually think the film is better. I think they, they made a really, really good adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the things that they did with it worked really well. Yeah. Now I think about it, because in essence, it is kind of a, it's a parody of Pride and Prejudice, really. Mm, apparently, I can't really see it, to be honest. <laughs> but... It's got me thinking, though, that obviously when it came to casting, it was a very deliberate choice to pick Colin Firth then. 
Oh, absolutely. And to call him Mark Darcy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just came to me then. Who can we get for Darcy? Yeah. I know, Mr. Darcy. I just think it's something interesting that I thought, never thought about. I think that's an interesting choice on his part, though, as well. Yeah, to agree to it. It's almost taking the piss, really, isn't it? Uh, so he's obviously got a good sense of humour. Well, yeah, and it was the first of that of those really modern mm. parts as well. Yeah, yeah. This he was playing a modern yeah. 21st century bloke. You sort know. of his first big major modern character, yeah. and it's him being a parody of what he had already mm-hmm. done. I have to um, highlight just a few bits that, mm. I, um, that I find really good. Um, the first thing I think it's got a great soundtrack. It's, yeah, it's very. Yeah. I, it obviously, it puts it in its time, you know, frame because mm-hmm. it's all of you know the songs that came out around about the time. And um, but it does work really well. I think all of his films do though too. I mean, even um, Wet 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 for Forward and I, th- I think that's better than a movie to be honest. I have to admit, it came on at the end. I was like, well, this is the bit that everybody was interested in because the song was huge when <laughs> this came out. Um, but he does. He has a really great um, relationship with music. I mm. think he he really loves music mm-hmm. and therefore it's a it's a really big element in his movies yeah. and um and this worked really well. well it works well for nostalgia as well when you look back yeah absolutely They're like time capsules of themselves yeah well that's what i think works within the movies that's what dates them if anything but not in a bad way in mm. a nice way like you say it's a time capsule it's a nostalgic element it, yeah it's a time stamp rather than a time yeah <laughs> i've got to, the bit I've, I've just got to highlight is um the fight um, right, between yeah. Colin Firth and, and uh, Hugh Grant's characters. Oh. Is, it, is, it, is it the first one in the restaurant? Yes, it starts in the street, goes into the restaurant and then come out uh, <laughs> out of the window. <laughs> so, oh. Literally. Um, is this <laughs> um, where they, they stop to sing happy birthday and they're apologising yes, to everyone? <laughs> yes. Oh, it's fantastic. Sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, so sorry. I'm so sorry. Of course I'll pay. You know, it's, <laughs> you it's just... Birthday? Yeah, it's oh. brilliant. And he's singing Happy Birthday, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Oh it's so, and it's so it well choreographed because obviously it's choreographed, it mm. needs to be. But <sighs> it does not appear choreographed at all. That is how a real fight between two normal two, men yeah. would go. Awkward. They would be like grabbing each other's chins and pushing yeah. and shoving and trying to kick them but missing. Slapping and slapping each other. It, do you know what? It would, it just, it feels so realistic, but it's yeah. hilarious yeah. to watch. Oh, that's made and me really want to watch just, it. <laughs> yeah, there's just the scenes in it that are fantastic. Mm-hmm. And that really stands out as a highlight for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, but it's another one, it's just entertaining. It's yeah. just, you, you finish the film, you, you've you've watched. I really enjoy listening to, to like Bridget. You know her narration and, and the story. Like mm. I just, she's so entertaining, and you come out satisfied. It's another one you just—it's happy movie, and and it finishes well. You mm-hmm. know, you just like, oh well, yeah, I really enjoyed that. So, you know, it's that just that type of movie. Yeah, very reliable, re- very entertaining, very British. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just everything that he was good at. Obviously, he didn't write yeah. it, but he did the screenplay. Picked up on it. Yeah. yeah sort of highlighted those parts and brought his mm-hmm. newfound genre element yeah. and put it onto it and made it like you say it made the book more than the book was mm-hmm. that yes it, i think it really did it really did it was very well done but now we're going to move on to his piece de <laughs> yeah, resistance this is like the seminal um apotheosis of everything this is his movie he's going to be remembered for yeah definitely oh, this 100%. is this is the one Oh, which is so good. So I'm going <laughs> to hand it over to you for okay. Love Actually because you are a huge it's, fan it's, of it's Love Actually. It's my second favourite film. <laughs> so, yes, I think yeah. it's fair to say I you're mean, a big fan. It's interesting watching, I think even you said it, watching these films because they're rom-coms and then trying to write stuff about them is kind of, mm-hmm. it's just different, isn't it? Yeah. What I love about this is that it seems like all of the ideas that Richard had in his, I'm calling him Richard now, first name basis, had in his <laughs> I head. We're, we're there. We're yeah. there. <laughs> um, he, all these ideas that he had for full feature films that he kind of knew that he'd never get around to making them all, he then put yeah. in these sort of episodes, these interlocking mm-hmm. episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think actually I've watched a, an interview with, I don't know who it was, maybe GQ or something. Um, and he kind of said, yeah, the Prime Minister story was an idea I had for a full film. The Colin Firth yeah. plot where he gets cheated on and goes to wherever he goes to and that was apparently meant to be a full film as well and and I yeah. think that's what makes it the ultimate rom-com really is because yeah. every it's story all is its own stories exactly yeah. yeah 
a bit like you said with four weddings it's not always love in the traditional typical sense mm. so in this yeah. you've got husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends yeah. but you've got fathers and sons you've got colleagues best friends and, friends yeah childhood romances brother and sister widowers yeah and all sorts of stuff is in like there. like you say what's so clever about it is all of the stories stand alone yeah by themselves perfectly yeah. but then the fact that the the way that they're all interweaved and mm-hmm. the characters know each other and so it, and it's not it doesn't seem like oh well that's a bit of a coincidence isn't it it just fits yeah they all know each other in a in a in a way that works, mm-hmm. yeah. you know what I mean. It, it's and they just weave together, and it's so cleverly done. Mm-hmm. And what's brilliant about this is, I think he kind of built up to it. Like he'd never, he he's known for his casting, his ensembles. Yeah. But I think Four Weddings was kind of an accident. It feels like an accident. It's got all yeah. these great like people in it that make mm-hmm. a great ensemble. But I don't think he wanted an ensemble. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it, mm. it just became one. And then it built to this huge ensemble. Mm. When we look at it as a... Obviously, I did a lot of work on multiple narrative films. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Several years yeah, it's of just them. a tad. <laughs> um, two dissertations. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, to what, again, I think it was the same video I was watching. For him to have brought up Robert Altman and his films mm-hmm. from, like, you know, Nashville in 1975 and, and Shortcuts. And he sort of made this network narrative, and it was all to do with people who know people who know people, and you could link mm-hmm. them, and, you know, you would have this great big mosaic of everybody's yeah. little stories going on. And I was so pleased that he actually mentioned that as an influence because it kind of validated everything I'd written about. And I was like, oh, thank mm-hmm. God for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, the idea that you can put together a, a web or a network of people yeah. and flip between them. He kind of did it in Four Weddings, but there was one main plot. You know, Hugh Grant's yeah. plot was the main yeah. one. In this one, you could take out any of the stories and yeah. watch them individually. So, yeah, there's a, yeah. There's a just a different approach to it here. And on the back of Love Actually, you've got things like Valentine's Day, New Year's yeah. Eve, He's Just Not That Into You, all those films that are kind of rom com Yeah, people looked at it films. and went, wow, that's mm-hmm. great. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? It's It's got its legacy in so many other films. Yeah. Um. Again, this what I mean, it's so perfectly cast. I mean, it's it's British talent at its height. It really is. I don't think there's been anything as good as this casting oh, I mean, since. It is absolutely superb. Mm-hmm. And all of the people that they've picked, they are really famous. You, you can point everybody out. You've got the likes of Liam Neeson. You've got mm-hmm. Rowan Atkinson, Emma Thompson. And everybody is great. Yeah. And there's a couple in there that are, were more, at the time, up and coming. You've got the likes of Stuart Allegia 4 and Andrew yeah. Lincoln, Kira Knightley, that kind of storyline. All of them were, were a lot like less well-known mm. at the time. They've become much bigger over the years. Martin Freeman, actually, as well. Yeah, Martin Another Freeman one. as well, yeah. Alan Rickman was one of the, you know, the big ones. He mm. was you know a big part and they're, they're just all fantastic it's almost perfect isn't it <laughs> there's two things um i want to highlight mm-hmm. one's on a on a positive note one's on a negative mm-hmm. so the the positive okay. i'm going to start with is the emma thompson scene in the bedroom of course with the with the song oh jenny mitchell it is one of mm. the greatest scenes i think i've ever seen and it's very good. Her, her performances. <laughs> so it's one of her greatest performances. I think it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. And again, drama underpins the whole thing. Oh, it's just, I watch that and I just sob. I just feel so sorry for her. It's very authentic. And when you think about it, you think, oh my God, it must be this massive scene. But it's not. It's so small and subtle mm-hmm. and it just moments, but it's, oh, it's just heartbreaking. Mm. That, have to highlight that because that is just, it's just superb. Mm-hmm. The second thing I've got to highlight is my only issue with the movie because it it's, again, a very satisfying script. It all wraps itself up in the end and happy ending and all this, except for Laura Linney. Yeah, You okay. never find out what happens to Laura Linney and I, it's always bothered me. That well, they never tied up her her storyline because everybody else's is tied up and I, I, it really bothers me. But can her story never... be tied up? That's the thing. Like, yes, it was... should. She should have got the guy. Of course, she should. <laughs> She'd been but, waiting for him for years. But she knew she couldn't commit the time because of her circumstances, and that would always get in the way. I'm not happy. I don't like it. <laughs> so that's my only issue. Um, on the flip side, I like how. Again, it took that sort of realistic approach. Like life, not everything's necessarily Perfect. tied up with the bow and the ribbon. 
Mm-hmm. And the fact that, you know, even Emma Thompson's story, you can't really say that's tied up as such. In fact, we weren't really even told what happened. Yeah, she just she's accepted him back, but the relationship's changed. I don't know. Are they together? Yeah, I think so. But she's obviously not accepted him at the end. They're not together together. But there's lots of things that do end happy. There is. There's a lot. Yeah, lots of happy endings. The two characters, as I've got an older and older and older, who I absolutely <laughs> think it's brilliant is mm. Martin Freeman and Joanna Page as the porn body double. <laughs> it's a hell of a way to meet. <laughs> the situation that they're in and they're just talking about the traffic, I just think it's, <laughs> it's perfect. Um, honestly, I've made a list. I made a list. It's not comprehensive, but key scenes. Any scene with Will Nye, literally, mm-hmm. oh, I think this is the best fabulous. he's ever been. He is just fabulous. There's just so great good. lines. I love his line with Ant and Deck where he's like, don't take drugs, kids. Become yeah. a pop star. They'll give you them, them for, for free. free. <laughs> Um, it's just there's so many great bits in it. I've actually wrote that the Ant and Deck scene. He, mm-hmm. he goes, "Thank you, Ant or Deck." Oh <laughs> 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 uh, well, yeah, the Rowan Atkinson gift wrap scene. I just yeah. think all of these individually oh. are just you'd be lucky to get one of these in any other rom com. Yeah, they're fantastically written script. The Prime Minister Hugh Grant's dance scene and his yeah. arrival, and he meets Martin McCutcheon, who can't stop swearing. Yeah. Um, I think Martin McCutcheon is very good in this. She is in like a bad way. She is, <laughs> yeah. She's just great. Mm. They all are. My my one of my favourite relationships in it is um between Liam Neeson and uh, Thomas Brody Sangster as Sam. Mm, yeah, that's a very interesting relationship because he's the w- widower, but it's not his son. Yeah. So that could yeah. have been very different, but I think it shows a really great bond between them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoy watching those parts. I love the bit where, the, obviously, I love the bit with Titanic in it. Oh, yeah. So do you trust me? It's <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. The famous cue card scene, you know, with Kieran yes, Knightley. Yes, of um, course. Andrew Lincoln. Andrew Lincoln, that's right. That was a very famous scene. And, and when she watches the wedding video that he's put together oh, of just her. Yeah, and oh, you yeah. see her smiling and then all of a sudden it clicks and you see it in her eyes. Yeah. You see her, her understanding. Yeah, and the dread. He's just mm-hmm. stood there thinking, God, she's caught me. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really good. I think the list actually could go on. I think the funeral scene's great too. It is. It's fantastic. It's literally moment to moment to moment to moment, and it just yeah. never lets up. So many good things. So we should mention our two players here, Colin Firth and oh, yeah. Hugh Grant. Yeah. Um, so I think this is Hugh Grant at his best kind of nice guy mm. role, I think. It's just because he's just best intentions, but very awkward. Yeah. Uh, not quite as awkward as is some of his earlier characters. It's just a nice amount of awkward. Mm. Well, I think what's interesting here is that he asked Richard Curtis to make this character different. He said, I don't want to play yeah. the same anymore. And he said, oh, yeah, this one's different. And then he, <laughs> Hugh Grant even said, yeah. but I just did it the same anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Colin Firth as well. Colin Firth is, again, I, I think I prefer him in this to Bridget Jones. He's just got yeah. this innocent bumbling, awkward guy, <laughs> but he's really nice at heart. And yeah. he's, you know... I just think it's re- it's a great storyline, that one as well. Mm. It's just really, really nice. I love it when he turns up with all the Christmas presents and then he just turns yeah. around and walks away. I hate Uncle... <laughs> What's his name? What's his name in this? I hate Uncle Jamie. <laughs> um, I think the thing was with, with Bridget Jones is that his character all along is meant to be misunderstood, isn't it? You know, yeah. We see it from Bridget's perspective or we see it from mm. Elizabeth Bennet's perspective, I suppose, and... It's misunderstood. So you don't get so much of him being revealed, I suppose, but in this you do. Yeah. I have to just add one thing in about Love Actually because obviously it's not just a film now, it's a Christmas film. Yes, that's another whole dimension of it. Yeah, it's it's got this whole other legacy now, which, I mean, it's nice because films that, that have this will go on and on. Mm. It's nice, you know, you know they're going to live forever because they're watched every year. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's become classics in their own right. And mm. not everybody, I mean, not everybody's going to go, oh, yeah, I watch Love Actually at Christmas. As I watch all of the Christmas films known to man, <laughs> I do. Uh, so, yeah, it's not even an exaggeration. That's, that's, uh, no, that's it's just really not. No, I'll, yeah. Um, but it, it's just nice to know that for some people, it's a staple. Mm. 
uh, of that time of yeah. the year. I mean, I didn't watch Love Actually for this because I can't watch it any other time than from <laughs> November onwards <sighs> to December. I can't, I can't watch it. I have like a, a month and a half window <laughs> where I can watch it and that's it because oh, it's God. too Christmassy for me. I completely associate it with Christmas. I think that's the thing. All of his films are feel good. Um, yes. And combining it then with Christmas, I think, was almost the best decision he ever made. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. There's a reason it worked so well and that people watch it every year is because it just, it really did work. Mm-hmm. So, so good. We have watched the movies, mm-hmm. we've looked into the careers, yep. um, and we now have to pick our top three favourite performances from each of these actors. Would you like to start or would you like me to start? You start. <laughs> I'll start. And who, who would you like to start with? Who should we start with? Let's do Colin Firth. Okay. I, I try to do favourite performance, but I can't. So I think <laughs> inevitably we've got two different lists. And in a way, this might help so we can, so we can hmm. appreciate a broader pool of films that they've done. Yeah. Otherwise, I think we might cross over a bit too much. Well, I think our, our listeners will have noticed by now that when I say favourite, it's favourite because I just really like it. <laughs> Whereas your favourite is the best performance that they actually give. Yeah. <laughs> so they're quite <laughs> different lists. We have very different ideas of what favourite is. But that's quite nice. I like that. Yeah, it's different. There's not as much overlap. <laughs> okay. So my number three, mm-hmm. um, we've just talked about it, um, is Love Actually. Colin Firth in Love Actually. I just, I just... I really like him as Jamie. I, by that point, he'd um, done a lot of different roles. It, this wasn't a complicated one for him to play mm-hmm. because it was like other things he'd done. But he just he does it so well, doesn't he? Yeah, sort of effortless. Yeah, mm. um, and and I just love it. Yeah, I, I really like him in this. Fair what enough. about you? Uh, I struggled because um, <laughs> although I like you know all the rom in fact i don't think i've put a single rom-com performance in any of these lists um oh wow because like we just said the performance didn't require a lot from them i think it was mm-hmm. very easy it came yeah. very natural to a lot of them so i've gone tinker taylor soldier spy oh okay he's barely in it um <laughs> however the scenes that he is in and the fact that the whole film in general is very mm-hmm. atmospheric um yeah the, the whole point is that everybody's kind of suspicious that you know that one of these five men is at the Soviet mole in British intelligence. Yeah. With Colin Firth, there's a certain laid backness and it's very mm-hmm. clever really because you can read that two ways that he's self-assured or smug or he's got nothing to worry about yeah. or it could be the complete opposite and actually he's the one putting on an act. Mm-hmm. I won't say what happens, but um, there's some very human elements to his character too that come out and I think, yeah, go on then, yeah. third place. Okay. My number two for Colin Firth is The King's Speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, he won the best actor for this, rightly so, I think, because I think he's fantastic in this. Yeah, I really I think do deserved. think he's fabulous. It's got elements that he um, doesn't do in his other films. It's got this serious edge that he's not done. Not only that, but you've got the vocal and the, like, the physical kind mm. of um, parts to it as well, yeah. um, which he just absolutely pulled off perfectly. It's Yeah, I think he's just deservedly got a lot of praise for this because mm-hmm. he is very good in it. Yeah, agreed. And that's all I'm going to say. Just go watch it, people. Go watch it. <laughs> Just go watch it. Uh, okay, my number two, I've gone with A Single Man. I haven't seen this one. I, I mean, it's by Tom Ford, the fashion designer. Mm. Yeah, he got a lot of attention for it, I remember, when it came out. So Colin Firth plays a British university lecturer but he's living and teaching in california in the 60s yeah and he's just gravely depressed his partner of 16 years died in a car accident recent to when Mm -hmm. the film starts and it's just literally left him broken like literally heartbroken he's had a heart attack he struggles to wake up every day because it's just a reminder that he's just waiting to die basically wow have to give this one a watch it's set over 24 hours and on this particular day he puts a gun in his briefcase when he goes oh, wow. to school, he clears his office, he goes to the bank, he empties his deposit box and he lines everything up ready. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. I think I'm going to have to go watch that now. There's some flashback scenes of especially the conversation on the phone when he's told the news. Mm. It's hard to describe, really, because although his composure's intact, mm. the way you just see him almost shrivel. Come apart. Yeah. yeah. Very special performance. Oh, I'll have to watch yeah. that. Okay. My number one, you're not going to like this. You're really not going to like this. You're going to be so angry that I've put it. It's not Mamma Mia. What? 
It is not my mia. My favourite Colin Firth performance is What a Girl Wants. What? <laughs> what a Girl Wants oh, is God. my favourite uh, Colin Firth. Oh. I love him in that. I feel a bit sick. It, <laughs> I, I told you. I haven't you would. seen it too far. It's, um, it's a movie that means a lot to me because it came out in my impressionable years my yeah. like going into my teens it's like me um, and a cinderella story isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much um and it meant a lot to me at the time i really enjoyed the film mm. and i think he just has a great arc in it okay he plays um a man who um he didn't know he had a daughter and finds out when she's like 17 she's american very outgoing mm. he's like running for a seat in like politics and things and he's you know he's got his like life planned out his career and how it's going to go and he's going to marry this awful woman who's wants to be with him for mm. power and it's it's just yeah awful um and really he's not like that he's becoming this person that he did never really want to be mm. um and this this young daughter comes into his life and reminds him of who he was and what he actually wanted but it's nice to see the shell coming apart through the film, you know, and seeing what he's really like. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever put that film on a list of. <laughs> yeah, stuff. probably not. Probably but not. Someone's got but to do I, it. it is, First time yeah, for everything. It's one of my. It is one of my favourites. I, I rewatched it a few months ago, actually, um, and I hadn't seen it in years. I just thought, oh my god, there's a reason I love this because this is great. <laughs> I just enough. thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> She put it above the king's speech. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Right. I do. For sheer nostalgic reasons, because okay. I, I just love that But one. like we said, you're doing favourite. I'm doing what I think is best. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Well, because yes, I exactly. put the king's speech at number one. I would never say that he's better in What a Girl Wants than he is in the king's speech. Right. I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay. I'm saying that it's my favourite. Specific criteria. Um, yes. Well, you, you've mentioned this one already. So I'll just, mm. even just vocally, this is a very impressive performance. And it comes across so mm. authentic. And he's He's not just doing yeah. the whole lots of people win oscars for playing people who have disabilities or yeah. um, illnesses or things like that but mm -hmm. he's also playing a historical figure yeah a real person yeah yeah and we just root for him so much in this film oh yeah you know it's an expectation of him to lead the country and he's not taken seriously because he can't form the words mm, yeah just watching the trust and confidence grow and then that final scene where he makes you know the title the king's speech at the eve of war yeah God. It's very, very well done. Okay, so we'll jump straight on to Hugh Grant then. Yep. So number three for me, and I have mentioned this to you a few times this week, okay. um, is Paddington 2. Okay. Oh, it's just, it, it's exceptional. It's like taking the piss out of everything that he is, was, and the acting profession and mm. and hamming it up, like hamming it up. It is very funny, to be fair. It is. It's just brilliant. It's, it is it is <laughs> really, really well done. And he, he looks like he's having a ball mm. doing it. He really does look like he's enjoying himself. Obviously, they made him do a lot of humiliating things. And as someone yeah. who doesn't really like humiliation, it's kind of funny to watch him do it. Yes, it is. But he, all, he does look, I think he looks like he's having a laugh. Mm. I think he really let himself go for mm. this one and just let it all out. And it it's just fab. Perfect vehicle for him. Yeah, really okay. good. Um, right, my number three. I only watched this yesterday. Um, I've gone for that film, <laughs> Morris. Maurice, Maurice. Oh, yeah, Maurice. yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it's just so different. I do want to see this. I really do. Everything else that he's done, really. Um, and the first film that made him get notice, the subject matter of it as well. So there's obviously the two young men who meet and sort of fall in love very quickly at the beginning of the film at university, yeah. Cambridge. Um, and then it chronicles the next sort of 15 years or so and the arc of his character. So initially, he's the one who's very comfortable, very open. He's the one that initiates a lot of it. Yeah. But when one of their mutual friends um, is sort of charged and imprisoned on, you know, indecency and immoral mm -hmm. basis for doing those kinds of things. Um, he completely changes. He worries for his social status. He worries for his career. Yeah. And he goes down a very different path. He rejects the main character. It's just hard because you understand the reason why he's done it. You know, it's a, it's a safeguarding yeah. thing. And but at the same time, mm -hmm. you you kind of hate him for doing it. But all the time behind his eyes, you're like, you know how he really feels. Yeah, and what he really wants. Very complex performance in that respect. Okay, so this my number two for Hugh Grant is that it's the only film that appears in both. 
um, lists. Oh, okay. Um, and it is Love Actually. Fair enough. Both of them are fantastic in this. I, like I said, it's for the exact same reasons that I feel Colin Firth was great. Mm. Um, he was given a, a role that he, there was no way he could not do this well mm-hmm. um, because he, he it just fit him like a glove. And yeah, I just I, I think it played to all of the best um, points that Hugh Grant has as a performer. Mm-hmm. It had moments of, of, of real greatness. Obviously, the speech and mm. this more serious part, yeah. and and um, actually makes you look at him a bit differently. But then you've also got the really comedic moments, the dancing, and then they're mm-hmm. going around and singing carols on yeah. the, knocking, <laughs> trying to find the right door. And there's, you know, it's just it's one of those very satisfying uh, performances. Mm. So yeah, that's my number two. Maybe the most iconic of his. Yeah. He even looks a bit like Tony Blair. You know, people like that. He looks <laughs> yeah. like it could be. Yeah. A, it could. It could have been the prime minister in another mm-hmm. life. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, another first time watch for me. Number two, I've put about a boy. Oh yes, I did see you enjoyed this one. There's something about this one. Um, his character's in a bit of a unique position because he's kind of jobless, but because his mm-hmm. his dad wrote this popular christmas song and he's just living off the royalties so the whole point of his character is he's got no responsibilities he's got no commitments Mm -hmm. everything is a no strings attached arrangement i suppose it's a very selfish way of living um Mm -hmm. which isn't bad until he starts involving other people and it's he's sort of this serial data yeah when he realizes that he can get with single mums because they have lower expectations of men and they're more likely to dump him at the end rather than him having to do it (laughs) things like that um but just watching him lie compulsively, sometimes with characters, it's very annoying um, to mm. watch people dig holes. Uh, with him, it's just hilarious. There's one, <laughs> there's one bit where he, he tells a lie about how a duck died. Um, it's actually because Nicholas Holt character throws this loaf of bread <laughs> at the duck. But he, he, yeah, there's, the way he just schemes and gets around and gets away with it every time. Um, but at the same time, he's got a flip side. People who do know him quite well, he's brutally honest with instead. Um, so at one point, he's asked to be the godfather of their baby. And he basically very bluntly says, well, I'd probably drop her on ahead at her christening. I'd forget all of her birthdays until she's 18 and when I'll take her out and, let's face it, possibly try to shag her. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing's just sort of it was very close to the knuckle. And it's very, <laughs> it's very well done. And they, when they say to him, oh, I just thought you had you know, more hidden depths. And he's like, well, no, no, no. None. That's where you've got it all wrong. I, I really am this shallow. <laughs> I am an arse, yes. <laughs> yeah. He just sort of lives that character and mm-hmm. he, he kind of perfect for him. Yeah. It was very good. Well, my number one, I have to admit, between Love Actually and this one, there's not a lot. And I actually think, in a way, I almost prefer him in Love Actually as a character. All right. Um, but I think just performance wise and just just the entire thing as a whole um it would be notting hill definitely for me. cloud atlas <laughs> uh, <laughs> um no not for me yeah notting hill i think it's more for the overall but not just him it's mm. it's him being a piece of this overall film because yeah. i th- i really like notting hill i like him with julia roberts and i like the story and i just i like what he does in it mm the center of that world isn't he yeah it's not necessarily that i like him i don't think i like him as a character better i think he's a bit of an idiot really he doesn't really have much going for him you know he's, he's just he looks kind of boring really he doesn't really do a lot does he not you know that. um no. so i think i actually prefer the prime minister really in a way but i just think obviously he's just very good in notting hill again mm. it's it was a part that he would just be able to play easily mm. It might even have been written for him because it's just he's just able to pull that off perfectly well. This bumbling British guy who's mm-hmm. in a world that he could never imagine he would have been in with this American movie star. And yeah, I just I I think as a whole, um, he's a great part of that film. Yeah, Richard Curtis apparently wrote it based on the real life encounter of one of his friends and someone who was an extremely world famous person. And it's still unknown to this day who it's based on. Wow. Well, that would be interesting to know. No idea. So number one, I don't I mean, this might make your day. Um, <laughs> number one, Paddington 2. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. Wow. I didn't rewatch the whole film, but I watched some clips on YouTube. Not Cloud Atlas. I, I'm sorry. I just can't. I can't get over this. Paddington 2. As we established <laughs> in, the, in the Cloud Atlas episode, but it's not about the performances being good. Mm. It was more about what it was about, um, so mm. I couldn't 
possibly have put a cloud atlas. <laughs> so um, I went back and watched some of the clips. <laughs> God's sake, I'm almost crying. It's just, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because I watched them in isolation, just like that, without, you know, without the broader context mm. of the film. But yeah, there's just a lot of enjoyment that comes from watching him as Phoenix Buchanan because yeah. you apply what you know about Hugh Grant as a person onto <laughs> onto that character. I love him talking to the characters and then replying. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah. like talking to his like his dummies with all the clothes he's on. He's a there. complete <laughs> psychopath, though, isn't he? Yeah, like, he is really he's like a light-hearted psychopath character. Um, <laughs> I mean, Hugh Grant's very funny. He's very good at comedy, obviously. Yeah. Anyway, but combining with the ridiculous situations that he's put in, like yeah. him as the nun or him practicing the yeah. the dance. I'd love to see him as the nun in a full movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just I, I would. I'd really like that. Uh, it was something about Paddington, anyway. The whole. Yeah, oh, the it's atmosphere lovely, of it. isn't it? Yeah, it's just a whole other dimension of funny. There's an element of magic, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just works. So that that's it. That, yeah. that that's it. That is Colin Firth and the British rom com, so to speak, and 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 Hugh Grant and bumbling British awkwardness and yeah Richard Curtis right we've made it Richard Curtis and Richard Curtis we have yeah we're we're, incidentally Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean if people already love the Vicar of Dibley and Mr Bean and the Thin Blue Line and he is a staple of British well Britishness British entertainment he's an absolute national treasure he is and he's still making great stuff oh absolutely so Moving on, because we'll start a whole new conversation otherwise. Um, so we've we've got a, just a little bit of news. There's been two big stories this this week. Um, the uh, shocking death of um, Chadwick Boseman. Mm. Um, ah, oh, forty three. It's just mm-hmm. tragic, and I think that the shock of it came from the fact that nobody knew he was ill. Yeah, it's sort of the last thing you expect to see. He had uh, colon cancer for four years. Mm-hmm. So he always obviously, like this will have been while he was making Black Panther and the Avengers movies. All of this time he was uh, suffering through this and nobody knew about it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he was just gone. Um, he, I think he had so much more to contribute. Mm, very promising. It's such a loss. I really do mm-hmm. think to the entertainment yeah. community. I, if I'm honest, I haven't seen a lot of his stuff. But in a way, even without having seen a lot of his things, you just know he's good. Well, <laughs> you know the the testimony, you know everything that came out, all the nice things that people had to say about him. Yeah, beloved, yeah. absolutely beloved. A bit of a blow. It's it's so it's a, such a loss. Tragic. Yeah, yeah, it was awful news. And then the other news. Um, but probably tragic to some people. I'm not really that bothered. Um, <laughs> is that um, Robert Pattinson has got COVID apparently? Mm. Um, so they've shut down Batman again. Um, I was unaware that they'd picked it up. I wasn't I aware that they must started have filmed again. Yeah, I can't imagine that they've been for long. Mm. Um, but they've now had to shut down again yeah. um, due to to him contracting that. Yeah, it's a very expensive manoeuvre. But is it a sort of a message to say that it should have waited? Should it all have waited? I think so. Yeah, I, I think know. the people who are trying to push forward too soon, because uh, let's face it, filmmaking is an extremely intimate experience. Yeah, yeah. They're all close together. There's no space, you know. It, mm-hmm. just, it just doesn't work that way. And I just think you are taking too much risk. Mm. I guess we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how that develops. So very, very quickly... Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> What's your recommended film for this week, Matt? I toyed with it. I've not not written anything down, so it will be off the cuff. So I'm going to go with, <laughs> I think, in terms of recommending something that I don't think everyone would have seen, I maybe would have done about a boy, but I'm going to mm. go with a single man instead. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you've seen Nocturnal Animals, you know what Tom Ford can do as a director. Mm. And it is quite an artistic film. Mm-hmm. It's very much like you're in the head of that character. The whole film is a portrait. In fact, the film is a painting. It's a photograph. It's a piece of music, mm. actually, for a lot of it. It's almost like a waltzy kind of piece of music. And it's a film. Um, so it's a very expressive image of this one person's life on one day mm. at a very specific moment in time. And Colin Firth is great. Julianne Moore is fantastic. Um, Nicholas Holt's yeah. in this. He's good, too. Um, it's something different, but with familiar faces. Mm. Well, I definitely want to give it a go after you describing it. I definitely want to give that a watch. I don't know if you would like it, um, hmm. but I think you won't be able to deny the things that are good about it. Um, mine, <laughs> Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, um, yeah. 
1971, I think, Gene Wilder. Oh, it's one of those British films that you just watch it and go, yeah, this is how you mm-hmm. did it then. This, yeah. is, this is a childhood classic. Um, it's very gritty, really. It looks, it doesn't look all colourful and no, it's bright not and childish. And no, it really is actually for the first. I think you don't even get into the factory until you don't even see Willy Wonka until about fifty minutes in, and it's only an hour and thirty-five minutes long. Oh wow! At least half is not even about the chocolate factory. It's getting to that point. Issues of class and. Huh. It's, you know, it is very grounded, really. Um, I did really relate the um, goals and ticket finding and the mm. buying, like, the hundreds of things. Do you know what it really reminded me of Go when <laughs> the COVID started and people were buying up all of the, um, yeah. the toilet paper and things and, and all of this and then there not being things on the shelves and mm. and that kind of hysteria of people buying. Yeah. It really reminded me of that. Ah, the greed, isn't it? The whole film's about greed. Yeah. And paedophiles. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> perhaps not. No, um, but yeah, I just I just thought it was it was um, it's such a lovely watch and it's so nostalgic mm. to what like childhood f- films were made in Britain at that time. And, yeah, yeah, I would definitely watch that. It's mm. such a good. Yeah, good I think it's re-watch. been long enough now that I could read it differently. Mm. It's it's funny. There's a lot of funny bits in it. Yeah, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Hey. So yeah, so that that's it. That's the episode. So, uh-huh. Matt, where can they find us? Well, you can find... <laughs> God, I went right into it then. Well, you can find us mm. uh, on the website, cinechat.co.uk forward slash podcast, or on any social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Just search Cinechat Podcast and look for our blue logo. Or you can email us at... Podcast at cinechat.co.uk. Nicely done. Thought so. Next episode... Right, this is the biggie. Yeah. We are taking on a project. This is not just one film or one person's film. This, well, it's a a person's film. He just happens to have an enormous catalogue. Lots of them. Of very famous films. We are doing a three-part Hitchcock extravaganza. extravaganza. (laughs) Is the only way of putting it. So we're starting part one in the next episode. um, And... Oh my god, do we have some stuff for you? Mm. Um, you will see the likes of Rebecca Vertigo, the man who knew too much, dialing for murder, just to name a few. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, it's going to be epic. And many more to come. Yes, it's going to be epic. We're doing eighteen Hitchcock films, people. So we're going to be busy. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. he just has this. Mm. classic old uh, style movie making but per- oh, it's just perfect there's nobody better like you no. can you can make no. comparisons but there is no yeah he he's is definitively one, one of the, the best. greats yeah so time. this is going to be fantastic yeah so i'm looking forward to this Ooh. um so catch us then Dude. on next episode hitchcock part one yeah take us um, up to so halloween <laughs> yeah it does it really does uh, so that's bye for me crazy good and it's bye for me